Well, good morning. Got a great crowd here today. Glad to see everybody could make it. Uh, welcome to today's program of a case for records management issues for legal counsel. Uh, I'm Mike Karagosian. I'm with the National Archives Records Management Training Program. Our presenters today are Aaron Casey, an appraisal archivist with the National Archives, and Hannah Bergman, National Archives Assistant General Counsel. So with that, I will turn the program over to Erin, and she'll do the first half of the program. Hannah will take over and uh, deal with legal specifics in the second half of the program. So you've got a lot of information to present. I'm glad you could all make it. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Erin Casey. Uh, as Mike said, I'm a senior appraisal archivist with the National Archives, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that activity is and what we do. But in basic, I work with a certain number of assigned agencies. Currently, I'm working with Department of Homeland Security and Department of Justice, so I know we have several people uh, from various component agencies of those two departments. Uh, in the past, I've worked with a number of law enforcement agencies, uh, Department of Treasury, uh, Coast Guard, and I'm also currently the appraisal archivist for the National Archives. You're going to hear me say things like currently because we do switch around a little bit as we onboard new team members or lose team members. So similar to uh, probably a lot of different people that you've talked to at the National Archives, some of our work is a little bit seasonal and some of it is steady, long term and changeable only by the fact that the records management business has a high rate of turnover. So those of you who are here in the room, I just want to get a quick hand count. How many of you are new to records management? It's always a high number, and I want you to feel like that is very normal. And what we're going to talk about today is sort of the, the highlight issues uh, that we want you to be aware of as a perspective on the legal aspect of things. There's a whole world of records management that I handle person to person with people who are records officers, uh, program managers, IT staff. Uh, transfer uh, to the federal record centers. All of this happens across agencies in generally the same way every place, but there's a lot of specifics as well to this business. And a lot of the answers that we give to questions are, let's find a solution that works for you. And it's not that there isn't a general way of approaching things, it's that we often find Given the differences between agencies, federal law gives us an outline, and then we have to dive in and figure out where the solution actually lies. So today, Hannah and I are going to talk to you uh, in two different perspectives. As an appraisal archivist, as I said, I work with agencies. I'm generally working with record staff. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is sort of a very high-level overview of records issues that are hot-button topics for today, and then also the longer-lasting topics like figuring out what the Federal Records Act demands of us and how agencies best go about implementing regulations. I do want to let you know if you have not already found them, uh, restrooms are out through this back door here and to your left. Uh, we do have some uh, cafeteria facilities and I believe they don't open until 10 o'clock so I apologize to anybody who wandered down there earlier hoping for caffeine. Uh, but we will have a short break between my presentation and Hannah's and that'll be enough time to run down there and grab something bubbly and caffeinated. Uh, emergency exits, uh, you will see glowing signs, follow them out in case of an emergency. You can also follow us and we'll get you out of the building. Uh, we often, we, we have a longer spiel for this for our classes that go multiple days. So for now, if we run screaming, just follow us out. Uh, cell phones and pagers, uh, if you're getting service in here, that's fantastic. I won't tell you to, to not pay attention to it, but um, if we do have ringers, if we could go ahead and turn those down. You'll note that we're recording today. One of the things that we have been trying to do through our training program is start recording more of our training sessions for people who can't be here in the D.C. area. This will go up on NARA's YouTube page on our website, archives.gov, and our YouTube site. And we actually have an older version of this course uh, that's been up for a year and a half or so. And what we've done today is update content for you, try to focus more on uh, up-to-date hot-button issues. And so as we see that these are changing over time. We'll update this course again, so watch our YouTube page for that. A couple of objectives for the course today. Number one, uh, we're just going to talk, again, high level about federal statutes and regulations. My focus as an appraisal archivist is on the regulation side. How do we implement all of these records management demands? We are going to talk about some best practices as I go through the regulations and what that means. We're going to have a few case studies of instances where uh, having a good records program provided a lot of defensible uh, reaction to issues with the public. Um, of those of you who are at all watching the news, I'm sure you're going to have questions as well, and I'll do my best to address that as we reach them. 
The uh, council's role in an agency's records program is somewhat minor to the extent that you will interact with record staff. It's going to be at a level of making sure that your records are covered, that your interaction with the records program is up to date with these regulations as they change. Hannah's going to discuss with you the new iteration of the Federal Records Act, and I'm going to talk in just very broad terms about that as well. And electronic records. So this has been the issue, I don't know, since 1985. Uh, we are attempting to wrangle a lot of issues at a time when there is increased congressional oversight, when the public have become used to what I call the Google way of life. Uh, there is a belief that if it's electronic and it's on the internet, it's going to live forever. That is not the way that we conduct federal records management. So how do we counter an expectation and build a defensible records program? All right, if you do have questions as we're going through, please pop up a hand and I'll try to, if I don't see you right away, just wave frantically until I turn my head in your direction. I'm nearsighted, so I'm going to be paying attention to what's in my immediate area. We do have a mic, and Mike Karagosi, and we'll pass it to you when we have questions. All right, uh, as we discussed, we, this is a two-parter, so you're going to start with me, uh, or records management as it relates to legal counsel. Hannah is Section 2, e-record keeping and e-discovery, hot topics and current case law, and uh, a brief a brief section on implementing the presidential memorandum on government record keeping. So Hannah will delve into all of those issues, the deadlines, and a little bit of the uh, specifics that have come out of that. All right, starting with what an agency interactivity with records management would look like. Agency-wide assistance on the legal aspects of record keeping. And record keeping and records management can sometimes be two different things, but let's use that term interchangeably today. Uh, there are regulations associated with how to keep certain kinds of records and how long to keep certain records, and that's usually where your interaction is going to stop with a records program. There are other aspects to this like FOIA, Privacy Act, uh, discovery of any kind, but in general that's still relating back to the actual practice of record keeping. So I'm going to talk more about those specifics. The life cycle of a record begins with creation. You have to ensure that you are in fact creating the records that you're supposed to be creating to document your programs. And that's the entire agency wide from HR all the way through to the minute office based programs. Anything mission related is obviously of greater importance than some of the purely administrative or housekeeping record material. But all of them feed into that same practice of making sure that you're creating what you need to in order to carry out those program functions. Management, and I, I have a little gesture and I'm going to do this, it's a goofy little thing that I came up with to demonstrate the records life cycle, but we start at creation and it's like sunrise. And then we have a very long arc of management. And management can take place over 180 days, instantaneous. It could also be something that lasts uh, 30,000 years, which is the longest current records retention for a temporary record, meaning a record that will eventually be destroyed. So our sunrise, creation, a very long arc of management, and we finally arrive at the sunset period, which is disposition. And we're going to talk about what disposition is, but basically, we keep something forever or we destroy it. Preferably, we destroy it. A lot of what we create in the federal government is eventually going to be destroyed, and that's really for the best. Not everything has value till the end of the republic and beyond. Uh, if the world ended tomorrow, what would we need to show that the United States had a mission, had a function? very little material that we create day to day is going to reach that level of importance. So we're going to focus our energy on the things that allow us to maintain our mission and our accountability in that meanwhile, that management period. So where you fit in as legal counsel, reviewing and approving agency policy. Uh, sometimes this role is going to be explicit and you might even talk to me on the phone, uh, finding out whether or not you're going to be signing a piece of paper to show me that you had an uh, interaction in that process. Sometimes it's really just going to be advisory. Somebody wants to make sure that this meets general guidelines. Record, non-record and personal papers. We're going to talk about those three categories of record business information. Uh, but also think about this in a broader context. This could be email, and absolutely will be email these days. Uh, back in 1992 was probably the last time we could say email didn't rise to the level of a record. Very little that we conduct electronically is now not some kind of business information that may need to be treated as a federal record. That could be blogs, YouTube. Uh, the video that we're creating today will be a record, and we will have to deal with it in that way. 
contractor created records. Do any of you work explicitly with contractors? Okay, we do have a little bit of information for you later on. Removal of records. This is a big issue. Uh, people walk out the door with record material all the time, intentionally or otherwise. I took some with me today, knowing that I'd be coming here, but I'll also be returning it to my workspace at the end of the day. If this were my last day at the federal agency and the federal government, uh, me walking away with record material would be a problem, and we would have to ensure that it was copies, not the original. What does that mean in the electronic world? What is an electronic copy of a thing? So we're going to delve into all of these issues. And record scheduling is the last topic that I'm really going to cover in depth with you. Record scheduling is what I spend most of my time on. This is an activity that's basically creating a list of dates associated with a series of records, uh, which is anything from subject files to dossiers to memorandum to housekeeping record material. All of these things have regulations that cover them, and we need to put a certain date on it to ensure that we are meeting that full records lifecycle. We're creating what we need to, we're managing it for as long as we need to, and then disposing of it at the close of its life cycle. This is the basic definition of a federal record. Hannah is going to talk to you about some important changes to the Federal Records Act, which have just gone through. But I like to keep this big block of text up in front of you. It's based on 44 US code, the Federal Records Act. And the reason I like this big block of text is that it is intimidating. It should be intimidating. It is an important thing that we deal with every day without realizing exactly what we're dealing with. But I'm going to direct your attention to the highlighted portions here. The definition of a record is stuff, things, objects that meet four criteria. Documentary materials, regardless of physical form or characteristic, made or received, and I want to highlight received, underline it, circle it, put asterisks by it, received is a very important part here, and preserved or appropriate for preservation. So the way I like to look at this is different levels of trying to figure out what may meet this criteria. And Preserved or appropriate for preservation is a little bit new ground for us. We haven't traditionally focused on things that may not meet the traditional definition of documentary materials while also being maybe just outside of that definition but still appropriate for preservation. Here's where we get into things like voicemail. Uh, your voicemail content, if there is not any technological way of capturing that. Uh, nobody's recording your voicemail and saving it to tape, and the tape is then made into a record for your agency. That call information could be lost. The metadata of that call could be lost. You wouldn't have any record that it had happened, but business may have been discussed, and there may need to be a recording somehow made, whether that is a piece of paper that you grab while you're talking on the phone and you take notes, and those notes eventually go into your files. Uh, whether you do some kind of electronic capture. Also think about chat. Do any of you at your agencies use chat through your emails? Yeah, a few. We have just started doing this at NARA. We have an internal policy that our chat is off the record, and any record information that happens to be conveyed via chat has to be captured in some other form because it is appropriate for preservation if it rises to that level. So thinking about all of these different aspects of a record as we go through, I do want to add that the Archivist of the United States is the one who gets to determine what is and is not a record. Uh, this role has been clarified in the recent revision of the Federal Records Act. And part of that isn't, it isn't the idea that we thought agencies were cheating. You know, this isn't based on some incident that happened. It's a clarification of roles that we are the people who are meant to be the expert on what a federal record is, what is or is not appropriate for preservation, and we are also the people responsible for ensuring its regulation and management through putting out guidance material, working with agencies. So the clarification of responsibility and accountability is really where we're aiming at here. Now that being said, there are two forms of record material, permanent and temporary. A permanent record is kept by the National Archives. We handle preservation and management after it comes to us, and we are responsible for it until basically the end of time, or at least the end of the National Archives, or whatever successor agency we will have, hopefully. Uh, temporary records, however, as I said, get destroyed, and that could be after the moment of creation. It could be three years. Uh, the average is probably between three to 15 years for most temporary records. For law enforcement agencies, you're probably looking at something like 25 years for most of your records. 
And I'm also going to talk a little bit in the future about the difference between how we handled paper in the past, which is much easier to preserve and store, versus electronic records, which have a shorter shelf life and require a lot more human intervention to maintain. But eventually, a temporary record is destroyed, most often by you, the agency, less often uh, because it has been stored with the National Archives at our federal record centers. We will handle destruction and inform you that it happened. But action is taken and disposition is ensured. As I say on the screen, NARA also determines the retention period. Retention is exactly what it sounds like. It is the amount of time that a thing is kept until it reaches disposition. Whatever form that record takes, it will eventually be handled in a way that is unique to it. Paper is shredded or burned. Uh, we have CDs, tapes, all of these things are masticated or shredded somehow. Uh, we do have a way of handling classified information that's different from how we would handle unclassified or non-sensitive information. Everything has to be appropriate to that form. Little visualization for those of you who are visual learners of the record's life cycle. I like the sunrise to sunset metaphor because it gives a real final sense to disposition, but this straightforward way that ends in a trash can, I like that visual too. Uh, we should be trained to think about things as having a defined life, and that life ends. That's a very important part of what we're going to talk about. And a lot of records issues come not because we deleted things too early, but because we never deleted them at all. So I'm going to come back to that thought I had about the Google way of life. There's this idea that the internet will just continue to expand like the universe itself. And it will just be glorious. And we will be able to find everything. Well, how many of you can find the first email that you ever sent? Uh, how many of you even have the same email account from the original back end days? Have any of you ever used the internet Wayback Machine? A few of you? I uh, highly recommend that if you're ever looking for something. It just gives you an indicator that even tools that exist solely to go resurrect old information on the internet are not able to always find everything. And that's because technology changes. Our search terms may be too broad or too specific. It all requires human thought and intervention to manage. So the less we have to manage, the better we are going to be able to expend our energy in the right places for less money and because we have less issues that we're trying to ameliorate in a rush. In an age of deep public uh, scrutiny, congressional scrutiny, this is a time for us to be ensuring that we are meeting these disposition requirements as readily as possible. So is everything a record? I apologize for this graphic. It looked really great when I did it on PowerPoint, but it's not so great today. Um, but basically what I'm trying to show you here is that there is a realm of federal records, our blue circle. There is a realm of business information that does not rise to the level of a federal record, that big block of text, made or received, documentary materials appropriate for preservation. There's also personal papers, which is this sort of cutoff uh, square on the side. And we're going to talk about what all of these are and how to manage them. But there's also a very big overlap of non-record material. This is business information, generally, created in the course of business. But for some reason, it doesn't rise to that level of needing management in the same way. You still have to dispose of it. It still accumulates. All of us who have garages are very familiar with how things accumulate when you're not looking directly at them. Um, so this is sort of the detritus of the federal records world. And our job is still to ensure it's not getting in the way or the budgetary way of our management of record material. So let's talk about what is and is not a record or non-record. I'm going to spend some time on this because you as legal counsel are probably going to be called upon at some point to do discovery. And you're going to run into an awful lot of non-record material that could have been disposed of before you had to perform a agency-wide email search. So let's spend some time dwelling on what we can get rid of. Agencies do have to manage their non-record material. And part of this is because a record must be identified as a record. That is part of the Federal Records Act, 44 US Code. We're ensuring that we're creating the right material, but also that we can find it once we've done so. If you check out the disposition of Federal Records Handbook, um, this is one of those tomes that you should keep you know, in your bedside table so that you can read it at night and just feel informed and dream big. Um, we, we have not updated it since 2002. It's not anything that is a current publication, but it's still the basis. Um, it's, it's sort of a guidebook to all of the regulatory material that's been produced by the National Archives, Congress, et cetera. So the handbook uh, goes into non-record material in a way that I, I really like how it states it. 
identifying federal records means distinguishing it from the stuff that's not federal records. That seems like a no-brainer, but it's often very difficult to do. And I, I find people are very reluctant to say that's a non-record because it means getting rid of it. And if you get rid of it, then you might need it one day. So the answer to this is that we can probably reproduce the record information other places, or it is, in fact, already residing somewhere else. And our non-record material is likely a copy. So how do we manage non-records? We start by having inventories. That's a lot of the work that I do with agency records offices. They are supposed to be conducting uh, inventories, full inventories, about every two years. So as you can imagine, that doesn't happen. The reason for that could be staffing, it just could be time, uh, it could be that they never had an inventory to start from, and so they're really creating a whole new system. As we enter the realm of more electronic tools, uh, these are becoming easier to do, but it's still a lot of legwork. Uh, sitting down in a warehouse and going through boxes of papers that were maybe never organized, um, going through people's email, what about people who've left the agency and their uh, boxes are no longer accessible. So inventory work is very difficult, but it should be relatively up to date, and that for you as counsel is going to be a great resource for knowing what should exist and what perhaps existed up to a few years ago but is perhaps no longer being created. This should also lead you to policy on filing. What should be identified as non-record, what can be handled within an office and doesn't rise to the level of outsourcing. What can be destroyed in three years versus five years. Maintaining and dispositioning non-records. They shouldn't just exist forever. They should also have a set retention and they should be enacted as quickly as possible to ensure that the bulk doesn't add up. Non-record materials, uh, we used to say that they're identified by the agency. Uh, Hannah's going to talk about some of the updates to the Federal Records Act. NARA generally has always taken an active role in assisting agencies in identifying non-record. It's a question that I answer at least once a week. Uh, very often it, it comes up when I'm talking to individual personnel at an agency, not even necessarily the records office. People are anxious about the amount of information that they have to handle. Gray areas for this, working papers and notes. We all create this kind of material. Identifying when it doesn't rise to the level of significance, when it can be readily got rid of. Everybody has 13 copies of at least one thing on their desk at the moment, right? So identifying what doesn't have any unique information on it, get rid of it as soon as you can. Preliminary drafts, not circulated for comment or that only have minor editorial changes, a circle around a misplaced comma, that is a non-record. It can be got rid of. Reference material that you use in preparing reports. This is a gray area because you could see where that reference material might help you interpret a final report. But in general, we're talking about articles downloaded from the web, a, a glance at Wikipedia to find out what the definition of something was, uh, something that's available elsewhere in better format. That format's going to be the record, and your final draft will be the record. Everything in between is your notes, your preparation, your background material, and very often can be treated as non-record. If there's any questions about these issues, that's when you start interacting with me, the appraisal archivist, and we work together to determine whether there's any significance to these gray area activities. I'm going to run through some of this information. You do have it printed before you. Uh, when we design these courses, we're generally looking to give you a reference that you can take with you and also material that we can discuss in class. So if you have questions about any of the slides as I go through faster, please just put up a hand. So working papers and drafts, I've already used this word unique information, substantive information. Most of what we're putting on drafts are minor comments. Um, they're resolved in the course of creating a final product, and a lot of that resolution takes place in other realms like email or phone calls, and it's not even recorded on the draft itself. So we often just treat these as non-record material. Uh, you should be looking at your documentation policies, however, and policies here um, are going to be issued as something like a records management directive. And I often find that these directives have not been issued since, say, 1998. Uh, my rule of thumb is that if you have a coworker who is older than the last issued records directive, it is time to reissue that. Okay, and the same thing would go, by the way, for anything we're talking about today, an inventory, a record schedule, anything before 1982, just think of it as not functional anymore. It's not addressing your current needs. And these policies could be a place to tell you, uh, should 
all drafts issued by a senior agency official be considered record material because their hand is on it. They're looking at a product that's probably already closer to final anyway. And maybe every comment they make is going to be deemed significant, unique, and we should capture everything created by them. Whereas the original staffer who started drafting this document doesn't have a hand in it after the original was put together and circulated for comment, so theirs is going to be non-record. Policies can help establish these things. That may not rise to the level of policy in your agency, but practices are in place, certainly. And the last time we examined our practices instead of just starting to do them, often gets in the way of management. So senior officials, high-level staff, uh, we often say for agencies who are dealing with R&D, uh, research, uh, any kind of heavy development issues, you might want to keep everything created by, say, a scientist in a lab, uh, but that would not be necessarily the same for somebody in HR. Anybody who is managing a major contract, your contract should specify how much background information, how much of the research you want kept as record material and transferred to your agency at the close of the contract. When we're talking about drafts in specific, we want to focus on anything that helps us understand the final product. Uh, if a major decision was made in the course of drafting and you switched positions, for instance, that would be a readily identifiable moment where you'd say, we might need to keep anything that documents how that change was made. It may not be on the draft itself. Again, this might be different kinds of information captured elsewhere. And it's okay if they're not all kept together, as long as you can establish that relationship. Uh, looking at the development of high-level policies and decisions. So um, since it's in the news, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm not picking on anybody in the room, but let's use uh, the Department of State email policy as our really high button issue here to examine how they should have had a policy in place telling them when to capture email of high level officials and when to preserve it. The when is really what's at issue if you've been listening to these news stories. It wasn't that it wasn't captured, uh, however that was done and whether or not that was appropriate. It was the when does it need to be transferred back to the Department of State from that official's inbox. So establishing immediate at close of tenure or immediate at the end of the year even, these would have been policy level decisions that would have helped establish when things took place, why major decisions were made. It increases accountability and transparency. So non-record material, uh, I have mentioned this word. Non-record is very often the same way of saying copy. It's transitory, it's not important. Um, we have this information captured elsewhere, if indeed it needs to be captured at all. Do any of you litter your desk with post-it notes? I do this all the time, 13 a day at least, and I have a whole system that I've got with my post-it notes, and I can't find anything without my post-it notes, but those are not recording information that needs to be with the record itself in order to understand what I did with it. Any completed drafts, even any drafts in the meanwhile that still have my post-it note on it telling me who I routed it to, extra copies of things, all non-record material. Those of you who work with uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, the military, I often find that you have historians' offices and a lot of the material in there seems like it's record material, but it might actually be non-record. These are copies of photographs, for instance. Uh, the, the Coast Guard has a beautiful internal museum of photographs of search and rescue missions but they're copies. They are not the original. The original has been captured by DOD and it's being handled in a consistent policy way at a different level than what's going on in the historian's office. So library, exhibit material, generally non-record. Uh, copies of correspondence, directives, etc. The original is the only one you need to worry about unless the head of the agency wrote something really explosive and juicy on the original somewhere else. So, uh, routing slips, transmittal, et cetera, et cetera. All of this lacks value, whether it's evidential, policy development, uh, record information is going to always be at a higher level than just business information. So the agency, oh, yes, we have a question. Okay, so um, on the non-record piece of what's a copy, oh. <laughs> you know, we, we're so on the piece of what's a copy, um, we now have uh, folders that go through a concurrence process with hard copies in them, but mm -hmm. we do also have those files saved electronically mm -hmm. on a drive. So would those uh, concurrence folders be considered 
non-records if everything's yep. located on an electronic drive? That's a policy decision, that you would make the decision that the, say, the electronic is the record copy. Um, we do something similar at the National Archives with the body of work that I produce. Uh, they go through an approval process, several different steps. We capture signatures and initials, um, and that is generally considered non-record material for us, and it may well be for you if they're not recording those comments somewhere else. Whether or not those comments rise to the level of creating value in the draft, if you're saying no to that, then I would say that's non-record material. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, we have another question. Um, on that slide, it says duplicate copies of documents maintained in the same file. And mm -hmm. I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit about duplicate copies in different files. Thank you. Files. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out, actually. Uh, so duplicate copies in the same file. Here I'm talking, and unfortunately I'm probably talking to most of you in the room, um, our notes. Uh, if we have, say, printed out 13 copies of a recent court case or a piece of a court case, uh, we do not need to keep all 13 copies. Um, I work with the Executive Office of the United States Attorneys, and this is actually the basis of a major uh, expenditure for them that they transfer to the Federal Records Centers boxes that were mostly copies of otherwise existing material. And this is an expense. This is something that you're, you're paying for shelf space. So if you only need one copy to understand what happened, do not keep all the rest of those unless they've got anything different on them, anything unique or substantive on them. Uh, this could be, I, I know we often do this, that we'll have our handwritten notes. Um, Mike, I'm going to borrow his introduction notes. Um, he's going to make a copy of this on a copy machine and keep this and the copy in the same file. You don't need to. There's nothing unique about creating a copied version of something. Um, print out, printouts, we see this very frequently, multiple prints of an article. Um, that just happen to all be kept in the same subject file. Subject files are absolutely the worst for this. Uh, so we do find duplicative material everywhere we go. And ultimately, it just comes back to your agency paying for that space to store it, whether it's internal to you or with us at the Federal Record Centers. Did that more or less answer the question? Well, I was wondering more about duplicates in different files. Duplicates in different files. OK. Uh, this is a, a, a gray area. Absolutely, because it might be that the duplicate that exists, say, in the uh, legal brief is being kept um, in the contract office as well. They're serving two different functions at that point. Uh, so even though it is duplicative material, it's the exact same piece of paper, they're actually answering for two different uh, needs within those offices. In that case, they're not duplicates anymore. So that could, brings us back to our definition of a record, uh, made or received in the course of business. Whoever created that original sent it to another place who received it and acted upon it. So action is often what helps us define a federal record. A copy is never going to be used for anything but reference. It's probably not even going to be used because it's a copy. Uh, but if it is actual material that is received by an office in the course of business and then they take some form of action upon it, even if it's only reading it, that's going to be treated differently at a record level. So. We have uh, our knowledge area courses. If anyone is curious about this, Mike is going to be a great contact for you. Knowledge area two has a whole section, and we can probably send out some information for you. There is also a handout for our, our knowledge area courses that helps define what is and is not a record. And uh, talk to me after class, and I'll see about getting you a copy of that record tree. It helps make a decision based on what actions were taken and when it was received. OK. Yes. I don't know if you're having a question and answer afterwards, so I can ask this <laughs> later. So, um, so we so. sometimes receive books from mm -hmm. not necessarily fans, but people who think they're experts sure. in what we do. <laughs> and then they send in, they say, for your reference. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if we're allowed to keep it because it might seem like an endorsement. Or mm -hmm. are we supposed to keep it? Is it supposed to be some sort of record or something? Uh, from a record standpoint, I would say probably not. That, that to me is just, you would treat that as citizen mail. Um, every agency, especially law enforcement agencies, deal with citizen mail. People just send you things um, apropos to whatever was on their mind at the moment. Uh, from the legal perspective of whether you can keep it, um, Hannah? Probably not. It's a hardcover book that has a price more than $20. Okay. Uh, to capture that for the video, the answer was probably not if it is a hardcover that has a price of more than $20. No. No. Okay. Yes. We're going to van a white mic over to you. I just
just have a quick question about discovery. Mm -hmm. In discovery, we collect thousands and thousands of pages of documents and may only end up using maybe a third of those documents in litigation. Mm -hmm. How would you classify the other two thirds of the documents that we never used? Uh, they are, that's a good question. So uh, once you have a collection of material that has been created, uh, it should be disposed of and if you are not using it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not record material. Uh, it just wasn't used for you. So I would ensure that you have a policy in place at your agency uh, that nobody sent you originals. If they did send you originals, they should be sent back and then disposed of according to their record schedule and policies. Uh, but if you did have leftover material copies that were not used for your purpose, uh, and it was purely copies, you could establish that, then I would say that is probably non-record. And Hannah's going to dump him. Yeah. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about discovery um, in the next section. But I would also say that let's, let's say you do have a, a significant body of electronic records. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, was, I thought I was just, anyway. Uh, <laughs> let's say you have a significant body of, um, of material that's been collected in response to your e-discovery request. Um, the agency has sent it to DOJ. DOJ is processing it things are happening, or you, you, you yourself have independent litigating authority and you're processing that as part of a litigation matter, um, I would apply the record schedule that a, for that case file, right? So y you may have um, materials that ultimately do make it as into the, the litigation or used as exhibits um, in your court filings. Um, you have the body that you've collected um, of material that was useful, and then the things that you ignored. I would essentially apply the, in, the, the case file schedule to that, that entire matter, um, rather than try and parse out, oh, well, I didn't use this gigabyte of, like, of e-discovery material, so I didn't act on it. Is it a copy or not? Um, then, so if you're the agency who sent the information to DOJ, you may have one disposition for that information. DOJ may have another disposition for that information. Um, and you know, it's most likely that that litigation file is going to be managed by the litigating agency, not sort of your the internal counsel's office. Is that is that is that helpful? Okay. Any further questions about non-record material? Okay, Hannah and I will both be here during breaks, and I'll linger a little bit before you all run off for lunch at twelve. So, yeah, we do have another question. Yeah, I guess just while um, we're having a bit of a Q&A, mm -hmm. I, um, I think one hesitation that we've found um, in my agency about getting rid of non-record material is that it's a very, it's a large agency and mm -hmm. there's a concern that something will get FOIA'd oh, right. and someone won't know the instance that it got FOIA'd and then there will be some confusion about whether um, it was going to be responsive to the FOIA that came in, even if it's not a federal record, mm -hmm. um, because it's broader. And so that's been leading to a lot of reluctance to get rid of anything. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys have counseled agencies on that before. Or? Oh, definitely. It's not an unusual attitude. The fear that I might need this to respond to something. I mean, the answer is it is defensible for you to be disposing of non-record material if you have policies in place that identify them and allow you to do so. Uh, if you have no established program to uh, help you identify and manage non-records, inventories, for instance, policies, directives, uh, it's going to be much harder for anybody to feel confident in destroying material. And that's why it is of utmost importance that the records office have these updated directives that say, this is what non-record material is, and it's going to include copies um, and, say, routing materials, you know, giving a list, giving people the tools to identify that is part of that directive and policy need, and that will help alleviate that situation. Uh, the FOIA rules, obviously, they are broader on the definition of record. If it exists, you may have to serve it. So eliminating what exists is defensible if you've got that program in place, and should be done in order to help narrow the scope of what you're responding to. So, one more question. Um, so if I, understand correct, if I understand what you're saying correctly, the um, policies and directives would be in addition to the record schedule, they would sort of, um, yes. I, mean, cause yes. I read these record schedules as part of our, our duties mm -hmm. and they're um, 
very difficult to understand, even <laughs> as an attorney, let alone sure. if we're trying to explain them to the program office clients. Right. Uh, so the, the question of record schedules, and I've got a couple of slides later on that we'll get to defining more what should be on them. Record schedules are only for records. Directives and policies will cover the realm of material that is outside of the federal definition of a record. So yes, policy should be in place. That helps identify these things. They will appear on inventories. Your agency may have, uh, for instance, a manual. Um, and manuals, they, they've become old-fashioned. Um, I would like to bring them back. Uh, this is something that I think would be of enormous use internally at agencies in identifying this kind of material. Um, but a lot of agencies no longer have them. They just post their record schedules on the web. Well, if it doesn't address all of the material that you produce, they're not useful, and they're not usually written in such a way that the layman interprets them. So, is it is really serving a different need? So, yes, one more question. Since we're doing a Q and A, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to go back to your very first slide, mm -hmm. which was not where the exit was. Uh, the definition of a record. Yes. <laughs> um, I was a little confused about this because it seemed like you were you. You are moving from the discussion of what do you have to keep once it's created versus when do we have to actually create a record. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think that was really part of NARA's duties. You were talking about a voicemail, for instance. Mm -hmm. And in litigation, we have a policy of if we don't have, if for regular business purposes we purchased a, vo a voicemail system that doesn't have the capacity to extract the voicemail, we don't have an obligation under discovery to try to make an independent recording and keep that, keep that record. Um, but you are suggesting, well, if there's a substantive or a, a, a reason, you said that um, you, you, you pointed to the purpose um, appropriate for preservation, mm -hmm. you, you felt that the that that definition of a record created an obligation to the agency to actually create a record, go out of its way to record something independently. Yeah. And I, I, I would, I mean, I'm just interested in, in, in this because yeah. we struggle with that mm -hmm. when we have, for instance, I do environmental law and so we do NEPA, which has a statute and has an, it, the statute tells the agency what kind of documents to create, and mm -hmm. so I would use that as, a, as my, my guidance, but then we also have our own internal reasons, business practices mm -hmm. to create certain documents. Yeah. We have our own interest to document our decision-making process for defense, so we have our own incentive to create certain things and not create certain things. That so is actually the entirety of what I've been talking about. Yeah, you have a program in place that does tell you what to create in order to record your business process. Not every agency does. Um, and, uh, and the National Archives is included in this. You know, as technologies change, as practices change uh, over time, we used to have a pool of people who sat and recorded our phone conversations for us and then wrote a memo to the file and kept that file in their desk right next to them under lock and key. We, we, the world changes, and absolutely our policies should change with us. The obligation to create something is whether or not record material, business material, mission-related material is being created in a place where it's not being captured as documentary material. So you'll note that the, the Federal Records Act does specify documentary material. Um, the story that I always tell for this, uh, President Obama comes up to me. I've been identified by my, my badge as a federal employee. He comes up to me and he whispers in my ear, nuclear secrets. So I have made or received, uh, I have received this information, but I don't have it yet in documentary form. Uh, so I write it down on my hand. And now I've got the President's nuclear secrets written on my hand. Is my hand appropriate for preservation? I'm not giving my hand to the National Archives. Uh, so I go and I make a copy of my hand on the copy machine, and I now have a printout of my hand with that secret written on it. Now I have something that is appropriate for preservation. It captures the information that was received by me in the course of business, and it meets that documentary material standard. So the, the FRA definition of a record should be taken holistically. We're, we're approaching this as it's meeting multiple criteria. So if in your voicemail, uh, you have no obligation to capture what was said because of your policy is in place, but major business information was exchanged. You would probably be writing that down somewhere. You know, it would be captured, recorded somehow as a decision that was made. Well, if not, then we'll have a conversation <laughs> later. But in general, this, that's the obligation, is to ensure that you have accounted for major 
and substantive is again the word that we're going to use here, unique or substantive information that is not somehow being recorded elsewhere if it meets your need. Okay. I feel like we're still in a gray area with you. How about we approach afterward and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm mindful of our time, so I'm gonna pause questions here for a moment and go ahead a few more slides and we'll see where we get to. Okay, uh, we have talked a little bit about non-record, but what I want to emphasize on this slide, uh, I think we've already reached this period of concern in this class. So uh, this, the first bullet here, giving responsibility to operating staff can lead to misapplication of the non-record label. This again comes back to inventories, policies, having a directive, and of course, having authorized people conducting disposition. Uh, it may not be that you want to leave it up to everybody with a computer to delete their own material from the share drive. So policies help eliminate that possibility. Uh, you should have records liaisons, for instance, in your agency who work within each office and are going to be responsible for carrying out regular cleanup. So that all comes back to building up a records program. You personally, as a council, are not going to be doing that or even leading that effort but you should be aware that that material is being destroyed at some point by the appropriate people. Oh, and the last bullet here, I just want to point that out again. When in doubt, if there is concern, default to record status and then treat it something may not be permanent, you may not need to keep it forever, but it then confers on it a little extra cover for you. You will have a record schedule that addresses that material and that will put a retention period on it and allow disposition in accordance with your existing policies. Non-records shouldn't be interfiled. So this is uh, the major difficulty I think that we all have is interfiling everything. And subject files I've already mentioned, I think they're the worst culprit for this. I create subject files as well and I'm the same, I do the same thing. Email, we absolutely, uh, we all get non-record material copies of transmittals. Um, the agency-wide blast about the holiday party, non-record material can and should be segregated and deleted. We're going to talk more about enacting uh, culling activities on your email as we get forward. And Hannah's going to address our capstone policy, which is NARA's guidance on email. So personal papers, uh, documentary materials. So we're still hitting that one piece of the FRA. But they are private or non-public and do not relate to or have no effect on agency business. There are a few uh, agencies that are accepted from the ability to cull out or delete or destroy non-record and personal material, and that would be, say, the executive office of the president. We take everything that they create. Some of it's really awesome. A lot of it is, hey, do you want to go to lunch down at the Pizza Palace? So that material can generally be destroyed as soon as you get it. Uh, I do recommend things like having a folder, whether it is physical or in your inbox, that allows you to immediately segregate personal or non-record material as you receive it. And that's just a quick, easy way of handling material, identifying it, and then identifying by that elimination everything that is record material left in your inbox or in that folder. Calendars are not personal. Even if you write down your dentist appointment on your government calendar, that is part of that federal record. So if we have concerns about things that need to be um, segregated for whatever reason, uh, that has to be addressed by policy. And it has to be very clear what will and will not be appearing on that calendar if you have to edit it down the line. So if you are using them intermixedly, I know I do, my chiropractor appointments are all listed on my government calendar. No one's ever going to be interested in my personal calendar. I don't rise to the level where we're capturing it. But if you are a senior agency official, it's something to think about. Should be clearly designated and maintained separately. Email. So email is a real fishy issue, obviously. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about email policy, email definitions, and we're going to get into guidance materials and Hannah's uh, part in the uh, following hour. An email message is created or received, coming back to our FRA definition, created or received, on an agency email system. It could include notes, it could include attachments, it could be substantive, it could be notes about where to go to lunch. Uh, we also include in this definition of email metadata. The metadata is information about information that tells us the, the who it was from, at what time was it sent, was it received, was it opened. Do we have any Good Wife fans in the room? Yeah, a few, oh, you should all be watching, it's fantastic. Um, and the reason I say it's fantastic is that they have entire episodes devoted to the question of metadata. 
and it's a lot sexier than it sounds, but uh, they had a really wonderful uh, exploration of what happens when a court case involves metadata for email and whether we can prove that information was actually received by an agency, who read it and at what time, and was it then acted upon. So metadata is very, very important in how we respond to email when it needs to be captured, when it doesn't, are all part of the policies that should be established at your agency. So we know what an email message is. An email program is the delivery mechanism. So there are two different pieces to this. The platform, uh, for instance, NARA uses Gmail. That's our platform. The messages that I receive are content that include content about the content. And everything else beyond that is technology. And we still have to manage that. But we're really looking at a small amount of record material out of the world that we call email. There are applications called email archives. And a lot of agencies had gone this route. Uh, we are finding that there are repercussions to any way of storing email over time. Um, but again, the Google way of life maintains that everything should always exist, right? In federal records, we're trying to manage that. We're trying to make sure that as much as possible is deleted. And the answer to all of this is also that that leaves behind a body of material that must be preserved until it is either transferred to the National Archives or a sufficient amount of time has passed that it no longer has value and can be destroyed. Email archives were set up as something of the answer to that. If you go the route of an email archive at your agency, something to be aware of. You may not be able to extract information once it has gone into that. This is separate from the cloud. The cloud is, uh, well, we'll go into the cloud a little bit later. I don't want to sidetrack. But an email archive application carries with it some security concerns. It carries with it FOIA and Privacy Act concerns. So you want to be sure that your agency's way of handling email that must be preserved for at least a certain amount of time is being enacted in such a way that it meets your other obligations. We do have a bulletin at the National Archives. Uh, if you search archives.gov, it's going to be listed as NARA Bulletin 2008-5. That indicates the year that it was issued. As you can see, we've been dealing with email archives for a while. Email can be removed from the server manually or automatically, whatever you choose. Uh, it should be indexed, should be associating files for search and retrieval. Here's where FOIA is obviously going to be a major issue. Uh, just because we have it all in a bucket doesn't mean that you can reach in and pluck out the single email message that you want. So we want to ensure that we are still meeting record obligations of being able to identify what we created. And here, coming back to our non-record and copy material, we want to make sure we're only pulling one version of that message, not snapshots over time of that same email message sitting in the trash button for however long it was. So, um, All of these are technological considerations. I bring them up to you only to be aware as they intersect with activities that your offices are going to be conducting. So again, issues that we're facing with email, uh, especially in email archives, it may not be capable of grouping things by their relationship. So if there's no intellectual relationship left and you just have things, say, indexed by the time that they were sent, you might have to use a search function. And that search function may not catch everything. So we, we have issues here. Um, how many of you are familiar with the conversation view in email? OK. That's a grouping of a relationship, a thread or a conversation. Um, if we didn't have that relationship in the email archive, we might never be able to find the 15 other emails that related to that subject. So, Thinking about the relationship is a big part of records management and maintaining that as we're in that management phase of our records life cycle. Uh, may not be able to maintain the records in usable format. This is a major issue for electronic records, not just email. Um, the life cycle of an electronic record starts to decay after about three years. Um, even when we're talking about hard media, CDs, diskettes, that kind of thing, there's a finite lifespan. It is affected by environmental factors. Uh, I was working at a company where the server was hit with, by lightning. I mean, the odds of this happening were very low, and yet it destroyed 10 years of email. So there are factors that have to be considered, as well as the amount of human interference required to update. So you saved it as a PST file. That's great. What happens when we no longer have machines that open PST files? So lots of things to consider, and it usually requires hiring somebody in IT who knows what a PST file is and promises to stay for three years to update it to the next thing. <laughs> May make it difficult to identify your permanent versus your temporary records and carry out disposition. I do not recommend jumbling everything together and hoping at the end of seven years that you can figure out what was what. And that is the problem that a lot of agencies ran into in the early years of email archiving. They cut everything 
and they put it up somewhere on a server or the cloud, and then couldn't later on extract in order to destroy. Uh, Department of the Army went through a very, yeah, sorry, uh, Army went through a very public email archiving problem, and they have what I think we all just internally refer to as the blob. It's now sitting out there, unfortunately, and you know these are things that have to be dealt with down the line. So we want to be very careful. Um, and users assume, not may, they do assume that the email application has replaced any other email record keeping system, which could include policies to print and file uh, to a case file, for instance. Um, if you have other needs, other policies that may interact with email archiving, a lot of people assume I clicked on it, I read it, and I'm done, and the universe will take care of it. So again, policies and directives for your records program help manage how users are interacting with your email content. We do propose at NARA that you make use of things like automatic deletion or culling. Um, this allows your system to automatically delete a folder labeled personal um, after a certain amount of time. Obviously, it's not happening instantaneously. Non-record, transitory email, all of these things can and should be got rid of so that they're not interfering with the rest of your activity. Uh, transitory email, transitory is something that only has use for a set short amount of time, somewhere between, say, 6 and 180 days. It's long enough to remind you to do something, uh, but once you have done that something, you no longer need the email that was reminding you. So how many emails does it take to set up a meeting? My understanding of the universe is at least 27. So uh, routine requests for information, uh, whether that is coming to a public agency inbox or you personally. Reminders, uh, notifications, distribution lists, listservs, um, you belong to you know, your alma mater is sending you a reminder about the reunion. All of these things, transitory value. We do define this. Um, the general record schedule, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute, gives agencies the authority to destroy immediately or when no longer needed for reference. So that's a phrase you're going to hear a lot, when no longer needed for reference. Somebody out there in your agency is always going to say, I will need this forever. So just beware of those people. OK, email management. I'm going to hit the highlights on this because Hannah's going to talk more about Capstone. Um, but NARA has issued a bulletin with email guidance. And this is our way of encompassing all of the issues that we've been talking about with email and electronic records content. The Capstone approach uh, that we have issued, that's the name of our guidance, uh, supports the PRMD, uh, the Government Records Management Memorandum. Uh, and it provides a method of complying with the need to manage permanent and temporary email in an accessible electronic format. That is a mouthful, so I tried to read it off the screen for coherence. But what we're looking at here is the need to manage electronically so that we aren't printing and filing. Why don't we want to print and file? Because we know that people don't. If your responsibility is to ensure at the end of every day that you print off the 5,000 things that you sent by email, you are absolutely going to put that off, and then you're going to retire. So we know that that wasn't working. And at NARA, that was our policy for a long time, print and file. I am still responsible for doing some of that in my day-to-day -day work because I produce other kinds of permanent records, and my email needs to be captured for that. But the rest of my email is handled in bulk through the capstone policy. So there are ways of addressing multiple issues at once. That's the gist of our capstone approach. We are not relieving agencies of their responsibility to manage email. We're just trying to make it less onerous. So what is Capstone? Capstone email approach takes the concept that there are no individual records anymore in email. We're not worried about separating out your email about the cat video from your email uh, telling you that your work is due tomorrow from your email from your boss saying, I just made this decision, go implement it. You are no longer responsible for printing out the important one and filing it with that other thing. You are no longer, you know, there are lots of ways of looking at this that we're not interested anymore in just the content of that one email versus the next. It takes the idea that you as a position, as an office holder, as a staffer, have a certain level of responsibility at your agency that we can more or less quantify and say that person is more likely to produce permanent material than that person. I at my level of my agency as an appraisal archivist, I have a way of handling really important things. I send them to my boss. My boss's email Paul Wester, uh, the uh, Chief Records Officer of the United States, is a much more important man than I am, so he gets to make sure all of his email is permanent. So that's the way we've been handling this through the capstone approach. We identify 
a body of likely permanent email, which is not to say that everything Paul touches is gold. You know, we still have to be aware of the things like non-record and transitory material. He's calling that out. He's making sure that uh, all of his cat videos are gone before we capture his email at the end of the day. But in bulk, we know how to handle these two various values. Any questions about Capstone before I rush forward? I'm mindful of our time and I'm trying to get you for a break at around uh, 10 minutes from now. I'll be around during that break if you have any further questions. Hannah, like I said, is going to talk more about Capstone. I want to talk about social media just briefly. Uh, social media, I think we all thought that social media would be much more difficult to manage than it turned out to be. The answer to social media is that it exists, your agency is using it, and it should be managed. So that wasn't that hard after all. What is social media? Uh, it could be Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, um, Instagram. I'm not aware of government using Snapchat, but you know that day could come. Uh, we are using it to connect people to government, uh, sometimes to increase transparency, sometimes to interact and solicit public comment on agency activity. Um, sometimes we're using it for recruiting purposes. Um, I don't know if, you know, other, other than USA Jobs, you know, using Facebook to say, hey, there's a big show coming, come on down. A lot of times we use it to point back to agency website where the, uh, the website is announcing something. I've seen a lot of blogs and I've seen a lot of video. Uh, so in general, we are trying to create some kind of collaboration and interaction with the public. Is it a record? Comes back to that federal definition of a record. Is it unique? Is it available anywhere else? We used to be able to say with some certainty that anything on an agency website was probably in paper somewhere else at an originating office. That's no longer the case. A lot of the content on websites and social media is unique. Whether or not it needs to be kept for all the time is a very separate question and should never be confused. But if it does contain evidence of policy, business, mission-related activity, it might need to be captured somehow. Um, is the tool authorized for use by the agency? Uh, we have found um, increasingly that you know, somebody got really excited in a program office and thought, I'm going to go create us a new Facebook account. And it wasn't authorized through the agency. So that might need to be captured just because somebody went and did it and it had unique information. So identifying what your records are, judging whether or not you should be creating them, and capturing them once they are created. Major issues for social media. <coughs> Coming back to the Googleization of the world, the public has an expectation that once we create it, it will exist forever. So again, we just want to make sure that we might need to capture something even if it doesn't seem significant because we interacted with the public. Uh, the comment section on anything is an example here. YouTube videos, um, you get the people who are ranting and raving and the people who submitted a serious comment and it led to some sort of decision down the line. Having a policy in place for how you're handling commenters, whether or not you will respond to commenters and if you uh, consider the receipt of a comment to be of the same value as a comment that was received and then acted upon, all of these are policy decisions that are individual to your agency. They're not dictated by the National Archives, just that you consider this as possible record material. Other things to consider, uh, data that resides with a third party. Facebook, for instance, is a third party platform, and you may need to work with them to contractually capture information that is being created on that website. Early on, we had, I think, high schoolers, I guess, were, were hired by agencies to sit there and literally copy and paste onto a Word document. That's clearly not efficient. There are tools that exist, not a lot of tools, and not a lot of them are answering the specific need that we have to individually identify and act upon record material. We do not yet have a capstone-like approach to social media that answers for things in bulk. So these are decisions that probably need to be made based on individual agency uses, maybe even at the program office level, how you're interacting with social media. Uh, so we talked a little bit about public comments. Um, the one thing I want to emphasize here is that your social media practices should be consistent with everything else you're doing with records. If you would have treated a comment from uh, a staffer on a draft of a policy document as a record, you might want to treat comments received from the public in that vein as a record, et cetera. You also want to ensure that somebody is in fact responsible for record keeping activity with social media. You probably have a social media office at your agency these days. Are they actually aware of their obligation to meet record standards? 
Uh, we have a case study, and I, I am pleased to report that this has actually resulted in an accepted record schedule. Uh, Department of Homeland Security submitted a social media schedule that covers every component agency uh, under Department of Homeland Security, and it covers every form that is known at this point in time to exist of social media, and it covers every possible instance of what kind of record uh, content is being created and captured on the social media. Uh, so it defines what is a record, it defines what is not a record, it defines how commenting policies are handled, it defines but does not limit to existing social media platforms, and it limits who is responsible for enacting disposition. Everything on that schedule except for uh, one, one type of video is temporary, meaning it will be destroyed at some point. And that also includes policy on how to interact with the third party owners of different platforms to ensure that that material is in fact destroyed. If it is permanent, how are they pulling it off of that third party platform and ensuring it gets to the National Archives as a usable, recognizable record? So this record schedule is uh, accompanied by policy at the agency. They have issued a directive that responds to the issuance of the record schedule. So we've got the list of dates identifying what the records are. They have an inventory behind that. They have a directive behind that. And there's going to be training out in front of the issuance of this to allow them to actually ensure policy is being put into practice. So that's an excellent case study for that. Um, I'm happy to point people to our website to find the social media schedule if anybody is further interested in it. Um, the other thing that this schedule did, which I thought was really brilliant and fantastic, it identified content versus copies of content. And Twitter is a really great example of this. You have 140 characters to do something for your agency. You're probably using that to point back to a blog or a space on your website or your news uh, being released by the Office of Public Relations. Twitter is often just copies of information when we're talking about federal agencies. We're not using it to create unique stuff. So identifying content versus copy. One of the most difficult things we've been talking about today, get out in front of it, establish a policy, and then be ready to deal with exceptions down the line instead of treating everything individually. So I've talked a little bit about record scheduling, and I'm going to wrap up with uh, some instances of applying that to your interaction with the records office who are creating record schedules. A record schedule is a document that lists series of records created by your agency. Um, not records that you think you might create in the future, but records you are creating now. And our regulations uh, allow you about two years after the start of creating a certain type of record to figure out how you're going to manage it and then create this record schedule. You may also hear a record schedule called records disposition schedule. I actually quite like that one because it keeps disposition in mind, puts it forefront right there. Records control schedule, I also like that because control, we want to make sure that we are actually managing all the material listed on this. Records retention schedule, uh, sometimes just schedule. So these are documents that are created by the records office at your agency. They are submitted to me. Uh, I am an appraisal archivist. I will work with that records office, go back to the program office, appraise the records that are on this schedule, and together we will agree or disagree on the proposed disposition of the records. Once we are all in agreement and all of NARA's stakeholders have had a chance to weigh in, we post a record schedule to the Federal Register. The Federal Register is a National Archives publication and it invites public comment on the disposition of records. The public care when we throw things away. They never care when we want to keep them. So we do not post permanent records to the Federal Register, only temporary records. They have an opportunity to protest, basically. Um, comment is, is the name of the actual process, but um, it mostly involves screaming and caps locks. So we, we have this opportunity to allow the public to interact with us. That comment process is captured. Sometimes it affects the decision to reduce or uh, lengthen the amount of time we are retaining a temporary record. Sometimes we switch it from temporary to permanent, depending on the level of the outcry, uh, the, the sense that they are, you know, that, this, yes, we misjudged. So this is an opportunity for us to sort of get a second look at things. Um, sometimes researchers will come to us and say, there's great public interest in this series and we just have never had an opportunity to use it before because it's never been kept long enough. That could affect our decision. We are interested at the National Archives in how the public interact with government. 
So we give this opportunity through the record scheduling process to increase accountability and transparency, to increase the possibility that citizens can actually use records as part of research um, jeopardy. <laughs> there have been a lot of different instances uh, for preserving rights longer. Uh, passports are a recent one I can think of. We decided to keep passports a great deal longer than we had been uh, because we found that genealogists were very, very interested in this. And there were also perhaps a lack of other supporting documents for immigrants from a certain time period uh, who were not getting alien files created, for instance, or who had not had any other interaction with a government body other than their original passport coming into the country. So this is our opportunity to serve NARA's function of interacting with the public while also meeting your need, hopefully. For the most part, it's a pretty smooth process. We go through the Federal Register. Most of the time, the public does not comment. And we get to the approval stage. The Archivist of the United States signs a record schedule, approves it, puts a stamp on it, and you're able then to enact disposition the moment it's been approved. Uh, the regulatory foundation here is 36 CFR and 1225 uh, is the primary source for the scheduling process. Walks you through for temporary and permanent records. Uh, talks about the authorities, how you develop a record schedule. It goes back to inventories. I've mentioned that a few times. Inventories are the basis for almost all records activity and it's the hardest thing to accomplish to create an updated inventory. So if you're aware of these, they are great tools for discovery but they also really feed into record schedules that start another great source for you. Uh, and it walks all the way through requesting a change to a disposition authority. Just because you have temporary, permanent, five years, 17 years, whatever the case is, set on a record, doesn't mean that you have to do that for all of time. If you find a business need has changed, this is no longer adequate to your needs, we can adjust. We go back through a process. We have various ways of handling this. Um, this is actually where I, as an appraisal archivist, most often interact with agency counsel uh, that you have found, for whatever reason, that an old record schedule is no longer working for you. And we do have ways of addressing it. Nothing should be considered to be set in stone. And this is a good opportunity to reevaluate. Perhaps you use technology now for a thing that used to be done in paper. And that has increased the ease and the use, and you're collecting more information than is actually identified on the record schedule. Again, for agencies who have record schedules that are from the 1980s, and you haven't touched those record schedules since that time, I highly recommend considering changing disposition authority, because it's likely that whatever you were doing in paper is really not the same anymore as what you're doing electronically. You might be collecting more information. You might actually be collecting less. Now, you could be scanning. It might be much easier to handle and preserve information now. So we should always consider this to be open to discussion, open to change. Uh, this does come from NARA's interaction with GSA. We used to be under GSA. We won our independence in 1985. And since then, we have been sallying forth. Um, but we are responsible for ensuring the adequacy of documentation and records disposition. That's why our authority is over record schedules, while GSA is responsible for the budgetary side of things. Uh, OMB also has a hand in this, um, saying that agencies may create or collect information only after planning for its use, storage, and disposition. I can guarantee you it does not happen in that order, um, but we make an attempt as much as we can to keep up as time goes by. So again, role for the legal counsel could be determining legal value of records. Uh, how long do agencies need to maintain records if you anticipate things like audits, uh, discovery, et cetera? And is there continuing legal value to your records that might make them permanent? They record some kind of major agency dust up um, that affects the records for that time period. Um, not very frequent, I'll be honest, but at the same time, kind of good to have in your periphery. They are an excellent source to you, record schedules and scheduled records. You want to know what is being created, how long it's being kept, and if it is being disposed of regularly. Uh, I also want to add to this that a record schedule is a mandatory instruction for how to handle a record series. Once that has been issued, that's why it's important to consider that they may need to change because they are mandatory instructions. If you have reached the destruction date and you are not destroying those records, you are in violation of that record schedule. And that sets up issues down the line, especially if there's any kind of lawsuit that comes along. Hannah's going to talk more about that later. So a record schedule should describe 
all records, not non-record or transitory, but all records that are created or received by an agency, provide permanent or temporary disposition, mandatory retention periods, how long it must be kept, and mandatory disposition instructions, whether it comes to the National Archives or whether it is destroyed by you, the agency. NARA issues certain record schedules. These are called general record schedules, and they account for about a third of the record material created by any agency, mostly housekeeping, uh, administrative type of records, but also some um, more common functions like EEO. Uh, so we, I have a little list for you here, uh, just so that you're aware that this is probably governing information you're interacting with. You may or may not even have been aware of that apparatus around you, but EEO case files, FOIA records, Privacy Act, uh, FACA, all of this is covered under general record schedule activity and dictates how long that material is kept. There is a third category of record material out there, unscheduled records. These are records that are newly created or newly identified. That's where inventories come back in again. And this is material that has not yet had a disposition assigned to it, so it must be treated as permanent because you don't yet know what the value will be. Until it is scheduled and approved by the Archivist of the United States, it cannot be destroyed. Um, I have some examples for you in your book, and I'm not going to cover them in the class, but this is uh, some basic overviews of typical record series that come out of council offices. Um, I do want to point out that permanent records must be kept at least 15 years. Um, it may be longer depending on your need. The, you know, that 15 isn't set in stone, but in general that's where we're aiming to ensure that your use of these important, significant, unique records has been completed. Uh, temporary records, I often find three years is the magic number. Under uh, GAO, we have a concurrence process with them that any record kept, a program record kept less than three years must go through their approval before we are allowed to assign a three-year retention to it. That's a little bit onerous sometimes, so in general, three years should be considered the starting point for a program record. Anybody who has any questions about these particular ones can come see me afterward. Benefits to you from scheduling, we've talked about all of these at this point. We're looking to establish reasonableness. We are looking to not keep temporary material too long because it's likely to come up in FOIA or litigation. Permanent records should likewise move out of your custody once they've reached their disposition date. The National Archives will take over handling and preservation at that time, and that allows you to shift some of the responsibility for response to litigation, FOIA, et cetera, to the National Archives because we will be the agency now in custody of those records. Um, mm -hmm. Continuity and good faith. This is the most important part of a records program. If you have a good operation, it allows you to respond immediately by saying, we know that these records were destroyed on time. We know that these records were transferred on time. We have been operating. We can prove that we've destroyed on time uh, and that we have been operating to quickly identify and respond. A case study for this, um, some of you may have heard of unauthorized destruction allegations. Members of the public often write to the National Archives and say to us, we believe that this record pertaining to, say, my employment record was unfairly destroyed before I could complete litigation. And the National Archives looks at a record schedule and says, yes, the agency was supposed to have this for a certain amount of time. We go to the agency and say, can you prove what happened to this record? Was it destroyed accidentally? Uh, or was it, in fact, being kept according to a record schedule and was disposed of on time and you weren't needing it to be responsive to this person? So the case study that I have here uh, does uh, discuss a unauthorized allegation that we received. And it was about records from seven years ago. Uh, this person was concerned about um, a video event that she thought should have been recorded. According to the general record schedule, so a schedule issued by NARA, not the agency, um, and the agency's record schedules internally dealing with any fallout from this material, those records should have been destroyed six years ago. So this person wasn't very quick in getting this question to us. Um, but the agency consulted with inventories. They talked to everybody at the program offices responsible for creating these records. And they were immediately able to establish, yes, we have always destroyed these immediately upon the date that they are eligible. We have consistently been handling it like this across the entire agency. We were then able to go back to this person who wrote this allegation and say the agency is not responsible for keeping this record. 
they destroyed it as they were supposed to, and it is not in existence anymore for you to continue to litigate with it. So that was a success story. They don't always go that way. But in general, we're able to prove, yes, agencies are conducting their business as they are supposed to be. I'm going to end with uh, just a slide for you here, some um, relevant bulletins that are issued by the National Archives. This is guidance that we put out for agencies. And you have a list in your folders there. Um, we are going to talk about some more of these in the following presentation, Hannah's presentation. Do we have any questions? I know I've went through a lot of material very quickly, but I'll be hanging around. Yes? Just on curiosity, um, do you have a policy or recommendation on considering statute of limitations and when setting up the destruction requirements or timelines? Do, do we have a policy at the National Archives on? Yeah, or recommendations. I mean, is it, yeah. do you say the agency must okay. always make sure you keep things um, long, longer or up to the statute of limitations, such as personnel records. That's what prompted. Yeah. So I would actually say that that, is this one on? Probably. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I would actually say that's a, a place where legal counsel can really provide a valuable interaction with the records office to have that conversation and say, no, the statute of limitations for tort claims is blah, blah, blah. We probably want to keep these records of the security incident where someone slipped and fell on the marble, uh, which happens here. Uh, for six years, right? Yeah. Um, that's sort of my general advice when I get these questions from agency counsel. One of the things that our office does, which is the general counsel's office at the archives, is provide that uh, con uh, consultation with regard to the general record schedule items. So the archives is in the process of redoing the entire general record schedule, renumbering it, making it user friendly, creating spreadsheets. It's going to be wonderful. Um, and so every new item, we are having a conversation about what are the um, what are the statute of limitations that may affect this disposition. So one of the areas where this came up, and we had sort of a uh, a, a really ro more robust than usual debate, um, was I think related to grant files. So when in, I want to say that when an agency gives out a grant, we had previously let those files be temporary with like a five-year disposition, I don't know. But for some, but the statute of limitations related to misuse of grant funds when the agency wants to go to a recipient of a grant and say, oh, you've really gone to Fiji with this money rather than figure out how to get to the moon um, and sort of recover that money. It was a 10-year statute of limitation. So it ended up changing the general records schedule to reflect that. Now, there's no obligation that that be the case. So I think in an agency-specific uh, situation, you would want to have a cost-benefit analysis and say, well, if I've been keeping these records for five years, but there is this 10-year period where I might need them for litigation under the statute, then what are the chances that I'm going to, that, that there is actually going to be litigation in, this, in that five-year difference? Has that happened before? Um, are the storage costs exponential related to that claim? W w is the worst that happens that you just don't recover that grant money and you just have paid that person for their trip to Fiji and you know that was the misuse of twenty thousand dollars but keeping that, those records all of those records that much longer would actually cost the government much more than the twenty thousand dollars like what's your cost benefit analysis um, so that's I think that's one aspect of it there is and I think this goes to the question you had asked earlier an obligation under Chapter 29 of Title 44, so 44 U.S.C. Chapter 29, talks about um, agency record keeping obligations. There is an obligation to keep records so that they protect the rights and interests of citizens. And so if a citizen is going to need to recover some benefit um, associated with the record, and you might need to keep the record for longer because of that, um, you, you need to think about the rights and interests. Uh, we're struggling right now with the disposition for payroll records. I think we had thought about a 99-year disposition. Yeah. Um, aren't you glad you don't work at OPM? Anyone, anyone work at OPM? <laughs> right? Uh, so payroll records have a 99-year disposition. That's a while. Uh, we're actually probably going to bump it out to 129 years, uh, which I'm uh, cringing a little bit about. But in fact, you're allowed to file an application to seek your benefits until you're 115 years old or until 
the beneficiary of your of your yeah right exactly so there is a possible there's sort of the horribleness of the civil war pension files possibility right we still have civil war pension files because in fact there are still widows of civil war veterans um yeah being paid uh, so, so it's, it is in fact possible that that scenario could arise. Now, doing the math and the analysis as to whether or not it's worth it to keep that record a little bit longer because of that possibility, um, I, I'm not going to do. I'm going to provide the statutory guidance. The law says this, it's possible those claims could be processed for that amount of time. You agency, you want to do sort of your cost benefit analysis have your chief financial officer really look into that, that is, com that is entirely reasonable. I really encourage that activity. It's something that, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I have the expertise to do in a general counsel's office, but it's certainly something that should be done, um, you know, in a conversation with your CFO's office or your budget people um, in where you're really seeing a lot of storage costs. Yeah, and your appraisal archivist will ask that question once the record schedule comes in. Is this being kept an average amount of time, too long, too short. We do try to help you with that conversation to reach an equitable answer.